My name is Greg Remke with Economic Thinking, and I'm doing a trial uh, recording for a presentation I'm giving later today at Liberty International, uh, a conference here in Madrid, Spain. I'll be on a panel uh, connecting the dots, futurescapes in healthcare information and nutrition against disease. I've written on this in a study for the Goodman Institute, and I post on normalnutrition.substack.com. I draw the title from the uh, best-selling book, once best-selling book, by University of Texas biochemist Roger Williams. He was a leading nutrition researcher and also a popularizer of nutrition research <clears throat> to the general public. His textbook, Biochemical Individuality, is uh, still in print, subtitled The Key to Understanding What Shapes Your Health, with a further description on the cover a timeless classic that links the diversity of our anatomy and body chemistry to our unique nutritional needs. We all look different, it turns out, and it turns out that we are even more different on the inside. Uh, the internal organs of the people in this room and perhaps listening have various shapes and reside in significantly different places. Dr. Williams outlines the astonishing scope of anatomical differentiation in his biochemical individuality textbook and in other books. It would be normal, he says, if some people here had stomachs six times the size of others and for some stomachs to be eight inches higher or lower in relation to your breastbones. Normal livers vary at least threefold in size the small intestine is said to be about 22 feet in length, but in fact varies even in small groups from 11 feet to over 25. Human musculature also varies widely between individuals, as does our circulatory system ner and nervous system. The pumping capacity of the human heart is three times greater in some healthy and normal young men than in others. The shape of major arteries leading from the heart, even the number of them, varies significantly from person to person. And our senses of smell, taste, and sight also vary dramatically from person to person. The sweetness of saccharin is 30 times more, 30 times as sweet as sugar to some people, 2,000 times as sweet to others. Some children can't detect the sweetness of a 20% sugar solution. Much as our anatomy varies, Williams, ar Williams argued that our brains vary as much or more. Apple's Think Different logo is a reality. We do, we have to. We learn differently. That's why education has to be diverse. We're individuals in body, brain, and mind, and only with freedom and in free societies can we flourish. Some of Williams' other book, Free and Unequal, uh, looks at education. That was actually republished by the Liberty Fund, although they no longer have that in print. Uh, none of his books are easy to get except biochemical individuality. He also was the author of You Are Extraordinary. In his book, no Nutrition Against Disease, I've listed the uh, chapters here. They're hard to read uh, here. It's not in Kindle, as far as I can tell, but I've printed them out. And the first is what we recognize the flaw in medical education, they don't teach nutrition. If you're a doctor, training to be a doctor, the most important thing for your patient is proper nutrition, but you're not trained in that. Instead, you're trained on pills, medications, interventions, treating symptoms rather than causes. He talks about a, a range of things. Uh, the fight against obesity is number six, and we have far more obesity now than we did then. A chapter on dental disease, this is a fascinating, fascinating area that others, uh, Weston Price and others, look at uh, that sounded crazy to me at first, but it's not. A uh, nutritional approach to arthritis and related diseases, other autoimmune diseases, uh, dealing with uh, inflammation. A chapter on how we can delay old, old age, that would be ideal for our, uh, our session here. And more on uh, mental disease, which I'll talk about later in the session, more recent research, and the battle against alcoholism. He has a separate book on alcoholism. However, uh, Dr. Williams' work and the work of other leading scholars was buried 
by a mystery epidemic of heart disease and heart attacks through the 1950s and 60s in America. President Eisenhower had a heart attack. Ansel Keys claimed the cause for these heart attacks was saturated fat clogging our arteries. He was a, not a medical expert, but he was a, a major promoter and he could wear a white coat, so he looked like a doctor on the cover of Time magazine here. Um, he pushed or led the McGovern Committee uh, Commission to uh, pass the low-fat uh, federal dietary guidelines in 1977. Uh, leading nutrition researchers like John Yudkin and others uh, testified that there wasn't yet enough data to support Ansel Keys' theory, uh, saturated fat theory. McGovern's reply was, we don't have time for more data. People are dying. So the food pyramid was born. But Eisenhower, a leading uh, uh, figure saying we need to do something, uh, for years smoked four packs of Camel cigarettes a day. Yetkin was the author of Pure, Ri Pure, White, and Deadly, How Sugar is Killing Us. And uh, his research was blocked in the major medical journals uh, by Ansel Keys and other similar antics that we have today in public health uh, research. In any case, uh, that was then, this is now, and now we have some tremendous progress in the last five to seven years. There's been a resurgence of interest in nutrition to resolve chronic disease. Uh, it's a tsunami that I believe will sweep through medical, pharmaceutical, hospital, processed food companies, cutting costs and profits dramatically, an earthquake for the industry and improving people's lives as well. This nutritional wisdom should never have been lost, but it was. We can blame the government or the private sector. There's enough blame to go around. But uh, we'll get to this good news after some more history. Here is uh, a page on the uh, American Dietitians Association formed in 1917. It turns out that the federal dietary guidelines and the low-fat crusade are the culmination of a decade-long or decades-long uh, efforts to change our diet. The progressive era, which brought so much economic disaster through the Fed and the income tax and other, other interventions in the economy, um, these public health enth enthusiasts of the progressive era were eager to improve the world and the people in it. Uh, they made alcohol illegal as a public health measure. Um, of course, the eugenics movement is part of this. Progressive elites, especially women, were captivated by the cult or fad of calorie counting and making themselves thin to separate themselves uh, from working women. They dined on more expensive and hard to preserve salads and vegetables. The food pyramid of the, food pyramid of the 1980s, which is now called the food plate, had its origin with these progressive era nutritional views and religion especially the Seventh-day Adventists with their Garden of Eden diet. The Kellogg brothers in Battle Creek, Michigan were Seventh-day Adventists eager to popularize, popularize cereal for breakfast instead of meat and eggs. The Adventist founders believed meat caused lust in men. The Adventists were the key were founding the, to founding the American Dietitians Association in 1917 to promote their dietary faith later the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and this is the nutritional establishment that dominates our universities today, the nutrition departments, influenced by the food industry and pharmaceutical industry, but as well by ethical vegetarians and vegans. Uh, Belinda Fetke offers a valuable overview in her uh, presentation for the Low Carb Down, Down Under at a Low Carb Down Under conference, and I recommend it. The processed food industry, along with the Adventist Church, shape U.S. and EU dietary guidelines even today. So, we have had a lot of progress in healthcare. I'm complaining here, and there's complaints around the world in, in recent years, but the progress was phenomenal and fantastic. The book, The Microbe Hunters, 
identified the microbes and disease vectors that caused malaria, yellow fever, typhoid fever, cholera, and later tuberculosis and polio. They ended smallpox. Uh, public health authorities and the regenerators work to clean up water supplies, construct sewage systems, vaccinate for smallpox, and arrest typhoid Mary. There's even uh, part of our foreign policy in the progressive imperialism, the war on Nicaragua, with the message of regeneration. This was uh, William Walker uh, electing himself president of Colombia, um, part to clean it up. The Yankee ingenuity would deal with cholera and deal with malaria in Central America. Another uh, aspect of progressive era or of uh, the public health concerns, the slaughterhouse cases deleted the liber libertarian core of the 14th Amendment on public health, gr health grounds. The Institute for Justice notes that the clause of the 14th Amendment that most explicitly empowers the federal courts to protect individual rights against state and local government was effectively deleted from the Constitution. And you can read more about that at the Institute for Justice website. So a lot of disaster, a, a lot of influence of public health in history, the history of the world, disease, hist, uh, disease influences the world, obviously. Moving forward, um, we have the question, uh, who should fund medical and nutritional research? Terence Keeley's 1966 book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, addresses a few fundamental questions about science res scientific research, namely, um, is it necessary for the government to, to fund it? And the answer is actually no. Uh, it turns out that more funding for scientific research leads to a lot more expensive research, but not, more, a, lot, well, not a lot more results. Often the leading people who control the grants are yesterday's uh, path-breaking researchers who are often block protecting their theories and blocking new research. Uh, earlier, economist John Jukes in his book, Sources of Invention, uh, looks at the contrast between the popular views that scientific discoveries in the 19th century made by self-funded citizen scientists. Uh, that didn't work anymore, the claim was, because science was too big you know, put a man on the moon and major research things, you needed uh, uh, big government uh, funding or, or uh, big foundations or uh, universities. But Jukes did the research on that and he found the major uh, scientific discoveries in the first half of the 20th century were made uh, at least a third by the same citizen scientists, amateurs uh, exploring and figuring things out, funding their own research. So it turns out that uh, state funding is still, uh, was then, and is now an expensive uh, proposition. Keeley's books documents the unfortunate trade-offs between, you know, top-down research agendas and the entrepreneurial-driven uh, scientific research. Our uh, nutritional research is stuck in the same loop. Uh, the war on cancer is stuck by giant funding of cancer research and the same. The American Heart Association is the main obstacle to advances in uh, dealing with heart disease. Uh, it's a similar story uh, we, we find when government and entrenched entrants pr protect themselves, standard public choice theory. And, and of course, leading scientists have to spend so much time writing grants and reporting on those grants. Now, there's another aspect of the tremendous success of scientific uh, 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 research and discoveries through the 1800s and earlier. Um, this is, it sort of intoxicated scientists and intellectuals. We had advances across the scientists, across the sciences, uh, you know, transforming alchemy into chemistry and astrology into astronomy, Aristotelian physics to Newtonian. Gains across the hard scientists help science and scientists and engineers better understand and reshape the material world and launch industries, the Industrial Revolution. Um, many academics then turned their gaze to society and social traditions and called themselves social scientists. And they had visions of social engineering they thought would reflect advances in the hard scientists. They were the progressives. The progressives thought eugenic science could improve the human race as well as cure diseases. The Rockefeller Foundation that helped eradicate hookworm, the parasite that lived with millions in the South uh, for decades, for wherever, uh, soil from bare feet, you know, these worms were infesting people. 
uh, the, the Rockefeller Foundation then, you know, went to India and invested to reduce disease there, but also focused on uh, reducing Indians. Um, they wanted to uh, reduce the population. The fear of overpopulation was gripping the world. And uh, uh, Matthew Connolly's book, Fatal Misconception, uh, tells the story of the campaign from eugenics to uh, uh, the war on uh, people worldwide. So we're still in the history of bad news stuff. Uh, most of us grew up fearing microorganisms, believing bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, worms were dangerous, unhealthy, and they should be wiped away from our homes, our hands, and our bodies. But we've learned over recent decades that many or most microbes are our, are our partners and protectors in life. We do business with them, exchanging nutrients and receiving services. Our immune systems are described as mostly for interacting with our microbiomes, moderating our microbiomes. What we eat feeds our microbes and microbiomes, and when our microbes don't get the food they want, they can start eating us, consuming our gut lining, for example. Many books on this, uh, the Sonderbergs at Stanford have a research network, Sonnenbergs at Stanford, and The Good Gut is one of their books. Taking, if you fix your gut, uh, you can fix your weight, your health, your long-term health, and your, your mood and your long-term health. Uh, Tim Spector on the diet myth uh, researches the real science behind what we eat. I actually am not a fan in some sense of the good gut and diet myth, but they are very well uh, researched and important perspectives and should, should be understood, I would argue. Uh, but there are contra contrasting uh, viewpoints. Tim Spector is a huge fan of the Mediterranean diet over uh, ketogenic diet and carnivore and so forth. Although in the end, he says maybe it's just because he, he loves Italy so much. He, he, he can't resist the Mediterranean diet. However, uh, back to our story. Um, consuming healthy foods help support healthy guts and minds. Our minds, our brains are deeply connected to our gut. The enteric nervous system is composed of some hundred million nerve cells in two layers lining our gut that communicate directly and instantly with our brains. How much of our brain is in our gut? Hard to say. I've got a gut feeling it's a lot. Um, the people I like even better who work in this nutrition space are the science uh, journalists Gary Taubes and Nina Teicholz. Uh, Taubes has written a number of books, his latest, The Case for Keto, which ties in not just a keto diet, but keto, uh, a ketogenic uh, uh, intervention or fueling your body with ketosis. Uh, more on that in a bit. Uh, Nina Teichold started the Nutrition Coalition, which is a major uh, research agenda to try and reshape the federal dietary guidelines to reflect, reflect the leading scientists rather than the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the ethical vegans and vegetarians that uh, and pharma-based uh, uh, doctors and researchers who populate the dietary guidelines panels. Um, a few more things about diet. When we eat, the food we eat fuels our body, and when we fast, that is when we don't eat, our body naturally feeds only the healthy microbes, uh, much as plants do when they extrude carbohydrates to feed their microbes or rhizome in, in exchange for soil nutrients and protection from harmful microbes. The Hidden Half of Life and other books, uh, What Your Food Aid, look at the importance of, of healthy soil for healthy food, healthy plants, and healthy animals, and healthy, and our diet being healthy. But our grandparents ate traditional foods, preserved with fermentation, pickling, and cooking with healthy fats in recipes handed down over generations. And often our ancestors fasted by choice or necessity when food was scarce. Or they starved when struggling through the destruction of wars or in famines. Not as often they feasted. Our bodies are designed or adapted for fasting and even starving, and adapted as well for feasting. 
adapted to gain weight, rapidly storing energy for lean times ahead. Our ancestors had, as we have, two metabolic gifts, uh, or uh, uh, you could call them adaptions, adaptations. Before, these, before the Industrial Revolution, these metabolic gifts helped us gain weight each fall to help us survive uh, winter and the occasional uh, crop failures and fisheries failures. But now it's always October in the grocery store with fruit, grains, and other high-carb foods and pizza advertised to us, and now many highly processed carbohydrate and sugar-rich packaged foods. But medical and public health authorities tell, it, uh, tell us not to fast. They warn us it's not a good idea even through the day. Public health experts, nutrition experts advise us to eat many meals and snacks through the day, have cereal for in the morning, whole grains, veggies, fruits, pea protein, legumes, fish or lean meat if we must. The World Health Organization tells us to eat insects, but uh, we're not there yet, we hope. We are advised to cook with healthy, air quotes, healthy uh, polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Most, most highly processed industrial seed oils, most are highly industrial seed oils that uh, quickly oxidize and cause inflammation. So where are we? After 50 years of government, governments and health authorities pushing the low-fat food pyramid, then food plate, Americans and Europeans are more unhealthy than ever. We live longer until recently, but have vastly more chronic diseases. We don't have the infectious diseases thanks to the microbe hunters, though we do have overact overactive autoimmune conditions from our immune system. But we have cardiovascular disease and, and uh, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, cancer, uh, autoimmune disorders, and mental health disorders. We are overdiagnosed with our advanced uh, medical scanning technologies, and we get uh, prescribed pills that claim to reduce the symptoms. It's a sick care disaster overwhelming the U.S. and European medical systems. Sick care, not health care systems. Um, the core, though, of my presentation is to celebrate the millions now escaping this dystopian, socialist, crony capitalist medical nightmare. Uh, at first, decades ago, there were just a few who recovered this uh, lost wisdom, earlier lost knowledge. Some were everyday doctors who got fat and discovered they couldn't get, uh, they couldn't lose weight and get healthy uh, just by uh, following what the public health authorities advise to eat less and exercise more and what they advised uh, to their patients overweight patients for decades. They assumed the patients were lying when they told them they, they were eating less and exercise more. And the revolution started too with sports medicine doctors, some successful authors with books advising runners to carbo load ahead of competition. But then they got type two diabetes. The resurgent awareness that most chronic health disorders are caused by what we eat and when we eat. Sleep, stress, and exercise matter a lot too, but as they say, no one outruns a bad diet. These ideas were known in the 1860s to some extent with the Banting diet. Uh, overweight guy in the 1860s who wrote a pamphlet and now reprinted by the Noakes, uh, Noakes Foundation in uh, uh, South Africa and available here. There's a long history of people losing weight um, by getting a better diet. The Atkins diet wasn't unusual. It was popular uh, around, uh, uh, well, 1980s, 90s, early 2000s. That's where I, I didn't know about it other than reading it in the newspaper, but I lost a lot of weight just from the influence of newspaper articles in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. Herman Taller in 1961, 1961 book, Calories Don't Count, sold 2 million copies. So calorie counting is the problem. Dieting is the problem. 
Carbohydrates are the problem, according to these writers from the 1860s on. Um, and Taller learned the diet from Alfred Pennington, who used it to slim down obese DuPont executives. And he learned about it from another cardiologist who worked on this in the 1920s. So it was long known uh, for thousands over decades that if you want to lose weight, you reduce carbohydrates. This low carb was a standard recommendation for obesity in Europe in the 1800s and 1900s. And 1900s. Um, the wars, World War II, uh, knocked these ideas away, and then, as we discussed earlier, the low-fat uh, craze. The argument is it's an energy balance. It's not energy balance. It's hormones. And the problem with the eat less, exercise more advice is the people who gain weight have a problem with their metabolic system. They have trouble with carbohydrates, uh, their carbohydrate intolerance. To attribute obesity to overeating is as meaningful to account for alcoholism by overdrinking. It's true, but not true, not relevant. The energy balance theory, calories in, calories in, is wrong or misleading. Obesity is not an energy problem, but a hormone or insulin problem. And they've published this, leading with David Ludwig in leading uh, nutrition journals. I have posts on this linked on my normal nutrition a website, and you can follow the links. David Ludwig at Harvard Health, Eric Westman at Duke, Mark Hyman at Cleveland Clinic, Stephen Finney at Verda Health. These are all leading researchers applying these ideas now. Help, they're reversing diabetes or putting it into remission. Thousands of people are coming off their, uh, reducing their insulin, coming off insulin altogether. Uh, doctors are deprescribing uh, David Unwin in uh, United Kingdom, diabetes.co.uk. We're helping uh, Americans get healthy again through the uh, online doctors, now that they can practice online. Uh, Low Carb MD Podcast is, is one, Diet Doctor, a website. Um, so lots in this history. And again, two metabolic gifts. If you want to lose weight, says Richard Fenmans, who's one of the leading writers on this, if you want to lose weight, don't eat. If you have to eat, don't eat carbs. Rule three, for diabetes and metabolic syndrome, carbohydrate restriction is the default approach. Try it first. Doesn't work for everyone. We have very different metabolic systems. In fact, recent research has shown that though some people can quickly unlock a fat to burn as, as ketones, others people it's much harder. But these metabolic problems helped our ancestors add weight in October to survive winter. The second metabolic gift um, energized us so we could escape uh, famines and walk to the next uh, village. Um, more on those stories, but it turns out you don't need to eat. You can become a uh, uh, metabolically adapted, so you can switch from burning carbs to burning uh, ketones. It's amazing. But of course, in grocery stores, it's always October. And the story I'm telling you is not told, not told to libertarians, not told to anyone. It's being spread through uh, uh, podcasts, through conferences. This weekend is Low Carb uh, San Diego. I attended Low Carb Denver and, and Keto Salt Lake. There's uh, conferences on ancestral eating, on carnivores. And of course, there are vegans and vegetarians that can deal with this by getting adequate uh, nutrition for their brains, but it, you'd have to supplement. Uh, vegetables have a lot of anti-nutrients as well as nutrients, so it's a challenge. Uh, most recently, the latest chapter has been uh, 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 Chris Palmer's book, Brain Energy, that was published this year or last year. And uh, the uh, metabolic uh, mind, metabolicmind.org, is pushing into this and funding randomized control trials on uh, diet and metabolic health. And you can read uh, Georgia Ede that works in this. We talk a lot about the, the college snowflakes and the research, mental illness uh, in England and America and on universities and high schools. Well, turns out a lot of that is nutrition people are not getting enough nutrition for their brains. Their brains, our brains are just 2% of our body weight, but uh, they consume 20% of the energy when resting and more when we're thinking hard. The brain requires energy and burns mostly glucose, yet it can burn ketones when they are available in the bloodstream. Our brains can't store energy. They're constantly sampling our blood, bloodstream 
uh, for available energy sources. That's why when you, you try to diet and you don't eat uh, to your full, your brain uh, drives you crazy eventually because it must have enough circulating nutrient in the bloodstream and it's going to make you get that nutrient if you're trying to not eat. But after prolonged fasting or very low-carb ketogenic diets, ketones can supply some 60% of our brain energy and uh, uh, lots of other health benefits there too. We have a century of high-quality research data on ketosis because ketogenic diets for decades were the only effective treatment for epilepsy and type 1 diabetes. So we wish for, we dream for a society uh, shaped nurtured by free and prosperous people, but we can't have healthy societies without healthy people. People, The specter of poor uh, metabolic health is haunting Europe and the world, and we can recover. Uh, Terence Keeley, who I mentioned earlier, his book on his ordeal with type 2 diabetes. Nina Teicholz was my introduction with her presentation at the Cato Inter Institute where Terence Keeley uh, introduced her and actually brought her to Cato, and they refused to pursue this line of inquiry since. I write about this on normal nutrition, and mostly I'm referring to books, podcasts, uh, Rhonda Patrick, Andrew Huberman. Uh, there's just tons of very capable people, but there's a lot of people fighting back on this. Uh, big Carb or Big Pasta is uh, in opposition. The governments are in opposition. The World Health Organization the, the, the public health authority. So it's a, it's a fascinating story and one that I think will help us on the road to freedom, peace, health, and prosperity. Thank you very much.